Hi everyone, I'm Amanda Kendall from the Thoughtful Travel Podcast and this is a presentation series on how to be a better traveller for the City of Joondalup Libraries. As COVID-19 travel restrictions start to lift, it's a great time to think about how to travel more thoughtfully and this series will help you do just that. This presentation is about how to be an authentic traveller and it includes tips, stories and resources to help you do that. First, let me tell you what I mean by being an authentic traveller and how I learnt to love this way of travelling. So when I was 14, I was super lucky and able to spend a month in Germany as part of a school language trip. It wasn't billed as quote-unquote authentic travel, which probably wasn't even a phrase back then, I guess. But looking back, it really was authentic and that's one of the reasons I really loved it. We got to stay with local families. We went to school with our host brothers and sisters uh, early in the morning at a very dark bus stop. That's what I always remember. And when I stayed in Berlin, I even got taken to reunification celebrations with the family I stayed with. We were there for the time when West and East Germany reunited. So here are a few pictures you can see here. Uh, I got to stay in a farmhouse near uh, Waldbrühl in near Bonn. Uh, in, on the left there, very typical German. Uh, there's a picture of me and some friends in Berlin, in uh, the no man's land of the Berlin Wall at the time. Uh, and then in these pictures, you can see where I stayed in Neustadt in Bavaria. And um, goodness, I look young. But I was staying uh, with a pharmacist and his family in a pharmacy. So I got to really see how life, everyday life worked there. Actually, it turned out to be very handy as well because I ended up getting uh, an ear infection and he was right there to help me out with what I needed. So all of this did feel very, very authentic. But uh, what about authentic travel, not as a student, but as an adult? So let's have a think about what exactly we mean by authentic travel. Uh, in some circles, the term has been kind of really overused now and lost a bit of its meaning, but I don't really have a better term to describe it. So we're going to stick with calling it authentic travel. And I think that authentic travel means having traditional local experiences, uh, getting off the beaten path, being where fewer tourists are, getting somehow getting a better understanding of the local people and their daily lives, um, trying to see things that are not just purpose built for tourism um, and usually not in a, in a package tour or a big tour. Although it's definitely true that some small group tours can be really authentic. So let's have a think about how you can travel authentically. The first way is to find some ways to meet local people. It's not always obvious, but there's lots of tips and tricks that we can use to find ways to get in touch with locals and really connect with them when we travel. One way is to use the Greeter program, and Paula from Sydney Expert uh, is going to tell us a little bit about her experience with the Greeter program around the world. Back in 2010, we took a three-month overseas trip with our then 11-year-old daughter, and I spent such a long time planning and, and I was using um, travel forums, which were pretty new back then. Mm. And I discovered in this Paris travel forum something about Paris greeters and the fact that it was a free tour with a local. And, you know, when you're travelling for three months as a family, you really kind of do need some free stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we decided to try and to book one and... Um, I had read that it was quite hard to, to get a tour, but we were lucky and we managed to book a tour for our very first day in Paris. And that experience ended up sort of pushing me to keep looking for these sort of tours because we had a fantastic morning with um, an 80-year-old gentleman oh, who had wow. lived, his, he'd lived his whole life in the Marais and he – strolled around with us like where he, we were his relatives, you know, oh. he'd never met. And he took us to his friend's gardens. He took us to little markets that weren't marked in my guidebook that were just, you know, like five little stalls in a, in a corner in the back of a street. And I, I couldn't even find the places on a map that he took us. They were just really tiny little obscure spots. Um, but because it was our first day of a one-week trip, he really set us up, you know. It was where we were staying and he kind of – showed me, buy your cheese here, buy your bread, introduced me to that baker and she made sure we got really good deals every morning. And <laughs> wow. Just that, that level of um, 
you know, insight. That there's no way I could have had the same experience that week in Paris if I hadn't met him. If you're curious about Paula's description of the greeter program, there's actually greeters available in many parts of the world. And if you're travelling domestically within Australia, there are greeters set up in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne and Adelaide so far. So it is a great way to, for free, connect with a local person and yeah, get to see a bit of, uh, bit of their city from their perspective. Now, there are lots of other ways that you can meet local people uh, and good ways to find locals giving tours as well. Um, even if they're paid tours, you can often find, you know, the right company, especially with, you know, really passionate, experienced guides. And that can be a really, really lovely way to meet locals as well and to really get to know something about their their hometown or home city. Uh, I actually recommend context tours as well. They uh, market themselves as scholarly tours for curious travellers. So many of their guides have post-grade qualifications in very specific areas like architecture or, um, you know, art, fine arts and so on. And so they run really, really niche, fascinating tours, um, either private tours or small group tours. So that's a really fun way to uh, explore a place as well. Um, and otherwise, just Google and look out for, you know, small tour companies, uh, other ways to connect with local people to show that they'll show you around uh, their city. And um, yeah, lots of different ways to do that. Now, another way to travel authentically is to stay with locals where you can. Now, I mean, one of my very favourite ways is to stay with friends uh, in other countries and other cities. And luckily, from lots of travel experiences, I have a wide network of people who are willing to have me to stay uh, and vice versa, of course. And so that's, for me, one of the best ways. But there's lots of other ways to find locals who can st you can stay with as well. Uh, one of my favourite ways has been homestays. And I've done that uh, each of the two trips I've made to Russia. Here are some pictures of uh, my mum and I when we were staying in St. Petersburg with a lovely woman. You can see there in the in the centre picture called Valentina. And it was such a um, such a perfect way to introduce my mum to Russia. She got to uh, chat with a woman uh, who, uh, you know, could explain all of the local, uh, you know, the local attractions. We got a great cafe tip. We went back to the, ta the cafe she recommended. I don't know how many times, at least three or four. It was so delicious <laughs> and, uh, and things like that can be amazing. Across Russia, I got to stay in some really interesting homestays with, um, with widows, with families, uh, with all kinds of uh, interesting locals. And it's definitely a, um, a very different way. I always remember my very first homestay in Russia, uh, landing in Vladivostok in the in the far east of Russia. And we were there in summer, but we entered the flat and we could see all of these uh, thick, thick, thick fur coats, things like I had never imagined. And she said, yes, quite often the electricity goes out and it will be minus 30 degrees. So we need these coats. I'm like, oh, I'm glad I came in summer. So, But that was an insight that I wouldn't have had in a regular hotel or somewhere else to stay. So uh, I think that that was well worth the effort. Uh, it's a great way to, to get to um, know the local place. So any other ways you can stay with locals? Uh, sometimes Airbnb is, is a good way as well. There's often uh, either, you know, shared accommodation with the host. Um, just check in the reviews that that's really the case. Sometimes it's advertised that way, but in the reviews you can tell that um, actually they don't really live there and it's just a kind of a, you know, it's more of a business than anything. But if the reviews say, you know, it was great to spend time with the host and that kind of thing, then you can know uh when I was in Denmark last year, I got to know several fabulous uh, Danish locals by staying uh, they in their apartments or in their, um, one had a converted basement. So we had quite a separate area, but we got to chat to them each day as well. That was perfect for me because I do like to have my private space, especially when I'm traveling with my son, but uh, great to get to know them as well. Um, home exchanges can be another interesting way to meet locals. You might not meet the locals you're home swapping with, but you often get to meet their neighbors and stay in a really local area where you're likely to get to know them. And also couch surfing. So if you don't know about couch surfing, it's an um, incredible setup, actually. It's been going for, I think, nearly 15 years based on a website where people uh, offer up, you know, so to speak, their couches, you know, anything spare in their house where you can come and sleep for free. It's, um, you know, based on a um, kind of a, a spirit of spirit of exchange. You know, if you travel somewhere, 
then you can stay and, you know, you'll happily have people come and stay with you as well. So actually, I now have a little extract from Craig and Linda from the Indie Travel Podcast who talk about some of their couch surfing experiences from around the world. We have lots about staying with locals. We, we are huge fans of couch surfing. We, um, we didn't really get into it until that, that trip to Chile. So we, we traveled for about three years and we went back to New Zealand and we learned about couch surfing. We're back in New Zealand for a year. And we thought, well, why don't we try this? We'll give it a go. I think we've done it once. And uh, we basically booked most of our trip in Chile all through couch surfing. And it was spectacular. Couch surfing's been really good to us. And the way that we travel, we often go somewhere for uh, a few months at a time. And so couch surfing is a great way for us to get into a city, stay with locals, uh, help uh, have them help us to kind of get oriented mm -hmm. and quite often they're more than willing to tell us that an, an apartment over here is a terrible idea or you probably want to stay in this area and so that's been a really useful way uh, as a practical example of how we can uh, get under the skin of a city mm -hmm. quicker and, and more easily than yeah. we would if we were just kind of booking something on Airbnb before we arrived. When we were moving into, we were traveling around Spain and we were going to be in two places for three or four months each. Both times we, we stayed with a couch surfing host for the first three or four days and then we moved into an apartment. And it was absolutely brilliant. In Jerez um, particularly, we stayed with this, this couple called Ana and Diego and then we moved into our apartment. And Ana and Diego stayed our friends and they're still our friends. They came to visit us when we were staying in Berlin and, and we've seen them in Madrid. So we're still friends with them and I think that's really great. Another way you can travel authentically is to take some classes when you're traveling. There's lots of different options uh, and I've done quite a few different kinds of classes as I travel. Here's a couple of examples. This is when I was visiting Cambodia and I was in a, a village outside of Siem Reap and the local group there took us through a cooking class. And it was great because it was just the kind of food that they eat regularly. It wasn't, um, you know, very fancy and, uh, and difficult. It was uh, something we cooked together outside and then we all ate together, the people from the village and, and the group of us who were visiting as well. That was both delicious and just so lovely because we got to, you know, kind of chat and we had, you know, often some language barriers. We had a couple of people there who could translate, but, you know, we also managed to communicate despite the language barriers and they would uh, tell us what to do, how to chop uh, what vegetables in what way and so on. Uh, and it was just a really, you know, just a really lovely way to really get to know uh, what their daily life was like. Here's another example of a class I took. This is in northern Thailand up in Nam. And it was at a kind of a, a cultural house and we were being taught how to make these beautiful offerings that they give um, as offerings at temples. So uh, it was tricky, as you can see, lots of concentration involved, but uh, it was just a delightful morning as well. So that was something really fun, something I wouldn't have even thought of um, without, you know, finding out about it while we were there. But that was a lot of fun. Uh, and cooking classes probably are some of the most common classes that people take because, you know, you get to eat something as well. And what a great thing to be able to take home, the ability to cook something from um, another culture. So here I have Eva from Not Scared of the Jet Lag. I found um, a website uh, of a place called Bait City, which means my grandma's house. Um, it's in Amman, in the uh, capital of Jordan. and um, it's actually like a cooking school type uh -huh. uh, place where three sisters inherited the house of their grandma when she died and they mm -hmm. wanted to um, preserve the, the really, really beautiful house um, in a sustainable way and also kind of do a community project out of it. So now you can take cooking classes where um, a woman from the neighborhood who usually don't work, I guess, um, cook with uh, the tourists oh. or I guess they also offer it for locals um, and one of the uh, three daughters or granddaughters um, sort of facilitates the whole event so they translate and they explain a bit here and there and they also take photos which I love because I had my hands dirty the whole time um, <laughs> so they just with my camera <laughs> and with my phone in between so that was really nice oh I love it yeah, and the house is so beautiful. Um, the grandma decorated everything herself. So there, like she embroidered the um, furniture 
and there's family photos everywhere and it's such a nice place. So if you think taking a class might be a great way to get to know a location more authentically, here's a few ideas for you. Obviously, cooking classes are definitely very popular and I think, you know, more and more widespread these days. Uh, arts and crafts, you know, some of the, you know, local cultural um, arts and crafts can be a lot of fun. Uh, and language classes can be great. I've spoken with lots of people who've spent, you know, a few weeks or even longer in a place learning languages in the mornings and then exploring in the afternoon. That's a fabulous way to uh, to have a, an amazing trip, an amazing experience. I myself learnt uh, Japanese in several countries around the world, in Japan, obviously, but when I found myself working and living in Slovakia, I just found a local Japanese guy, there was one, who was happy to do a language exchange, and that was another great way to uh, to have a class and uh, explore something else new about the city. Uh, any kinds of cultural classes, uh, green tea, for example, in Japan, uh, take a, a class in a tea ceremony with their amazing green teas, and uh, you might be converted. And I've also chatted with lots of people who've taken dance classes around the world, particularly in South America or Spain, where there's, you know, lots of amazing local dancers to try out and lots of classes who are really welcoming to foreigners as well. So if you are thinking, yes, I really want to try and travel more authentically, these are my main tips. First of all, do some research. The best way to have an authentic travel experience starts before you leave and involves, you know, hanging around on the internet and searching for the kinds of things that you think might be interesting. Make some personal connections if you can. There's lots of ways to do that, uh, both before and during your trip. And you might also want to consider the idea of slow travel. There's another video in this series that talks about slow travel. So you might want to look at that too, because I think spending longer in fewer destinations definitely leads to a more authentic experience. And remember too that authentic doesn't mean it has to be traditional. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, the old uh, customs and habits. It can also be how people typically live today and uh, experiencing their everyday life, which might be surprisingly similar to your own, or it might be really different. Have a think about how you could be a more authentic traveller on your next trip. With a bit of research and preparation, you can really dig deeper into a destination and have a much richer experience for it. This applies equally whether you're traveling abroad or domestically within Australia as well. Happy travels and thanks for watching.